deep learning frameworks. Assemble. Hello world, it's Siraj, and there are so many deep learning frameworks out there. How are you supposed to know which one to use? I'm gonna compare 10 of the most popular deep learning frameworks in this video across a wide variety of metrics from ease of installation to performance to popularity on GitHub. After reviewing the merits and drawbacks of each of them, we'll be able to come to some kind of reasonable conclusion at the end. So let's start with the obvious one, TensorFlow. Out of all the deep learning frameworks, TensorFlow is without a doubt the most popular in terms of developer activity on GitHub. Google created it to help power almost all of its massively scaled services like Gmail and Translate, then open sourced it for the rest of us. Nowadays, recognizable brands like Uber, Airbnb, and Dropbox have all decided to leverage this framework for their own services. Currently, its best supported client language is Python, but there are also experimental interfaces available in C++, Java, and Go. And because it's so popular, it has bindings for other languages like C Sharp and Julia created by the open source community. Having such a massive developer community has resulted in TensorFlow having rich, detailed documentation, not only from its official website, but from various third-party sources from around the web. This documentation covers its various features like TensorBoard. TensorBoard lets developers monitor the model training process via various visualizations, and and it's a crucial part of its suite. Another crucial part is TensorFlow Serving, which allows developers to easily serve their models at scale in a production environment and includes distributed training. TensorFlow Lite even enables on-device inference with low latency for mobile phones. But despite all of this TensorFlow is pretty low level, you have to specify a lot of magic numbers like the number of layers in your network, the dimensions of your input data, and this requires a lot of boilerplate coding on the developer's part, which can be tedious and difficult. By default, TensorFlow lets developers create static computation graphs at compile time. We must define it, then run it, meaning all the conditions and iterations in the graph structure have to be defined before it's run. If we want to make any changes in the neural network structure, we have to rebuild it from scratch. It was designed this way for efficiency, but a lot of the newer neural architectures dynamically change. So this default define and run mode of TensorFlow is counterintuitive and can make debugging difficult. They did add a define by run option called eager execution later on, but it's not native. Expect it to be even better in TF 2.0, which is about to release. Most of the time, TensorFlow is compared to the PyTorch library, a native define by run framework. PyTorch was created by Facebook to help power its services, and it's now used by brands like Twitter and Salesforce. Unlike TensorFlow, though, here it comes. PyTorch's default define by run mode is more like traditional programming. While training a PyTorch model for each iteration in an epoch, a computational graph is created. After each iteration, the graph is freed, meaning more available memory. Because it defines the graph in a forward pass versus a define then run framework like TensorFlow, backpropagation is defined by how the code is run and every single iteration can be different. PyTorch records the values as they happen in our code to build the dynamic graph as the code is run. PyTorch also nails debugging. We can use common debugging tools like PDB or PyCharm, and the modeling process is simple and transparent. PyTorch has declarative data parallelism, features a lot of pre-trained models, and has modular parts that are relatively easy to combine. And just like TensorFlow, it allows for distributed training. On the flip side, however, PyTorch lacks model serving in the well thought out way that TensorFlow does and lacks interfaces for monitoring and visualization like TensorBoard. But you can connect PyTorch to TensorBoard via some third party libraries like TensorBoard X. If we look at various papers from NeurIPS, the biggest AI summit of the year, it's clear that researchers tend to prefer PyTorch to TensorFlow. That's because it's best for prototyping or small-scale projects. When it comes to larger cross-platform deployments, 
TensorFlow seems to be the better option. But I should also note that the popular Cafe2 framework introduced by Facebook in 2017 is built for mobile and large scale deployments in production environments and was recently merged into PyTorch. This gives PyTorch production grade scalability. Curiously, DeepMind, perhaps the most prominent AI research lab in the world, doesn't use PyTorch. They use their own framework called Sonnet, which is built on top of TensorFlow. DeepMind's developers spent a lot of time having to acquaint themselves with the underlying TensorFlow graphs in order to correctly architect their applications. But with Sonnet, the creation of neural net components was made easy because it first constructs Python objects which represent some part of a neural network, then separately connects these objects into the computation graph. These modules simplify the training process and can be combined to implement higher level networks. Developers can also easily extend Sonnet by implementing their own modules. This makes switching between models easier. But let's put the research versus production pipeline debate aside for a second. What if you're just a beginner and just wanna learn how all this stuff works? The minimalist Python-based library called Keras can be run on top of TensorFlow or Microsoft's CNTK. Keras has support for a huge range of neural network types and makes prototyping dead simple. And the code is very readable. That's the reason I use it as a teaching tool so often in my videos. It's really easy on the eyes. Building a massively complicated deep learning model can be done in just a few lines of code. It has built in support for training on multiple GPUs and can be turned into TensorFlow estimators and trained on clusters of GPUs on Google Cloud. But the downside of it being so high level is that it's not as customizable. It's also constrained to the libraries it's built on like TensorFlow and CNTK. So less functionality than a lower level library like TensorFlow, but easier to learn. Keras is the best learning tool for beginners. All right, let's move on to MXNet. Jeff Bezos, I mean Amazon's deep learning framework. MXNet has been adopted by AWS, parts of Apple are rumored to be using it, and it offers APIs in a huge variety of languages natively, even Perl. Where MXNet excels is in its ability to scale linearly, more so than TensorFlow. The CTO of Amazon published benchmarks for MXNet's training throughput using the Inception v3 image analysis algorithm and claimed that the speed up obtained by running it across multiple GPUs was very linear. Across 128 GPUs, MXNet performed 100 times faster than a single GPU. MXNet has a high performance imperative API, which is pretty awesome. It's got the simplicity of Keras and it's dynamic like PyTorch, which makes debugging a lot easier. Unlike PyTorch, however, MXNet supports hybridization as part of its Gluon interface. The hybrid block class seamlessly combines declarative programming like TensorFlow and imperative programming like PyTorch to offer the benefit of both. Users can quickly develop and debug models with imperative programming and switch to efficient declarative execution by simply calling hybrid block dot hybridize. We'll notice MXNet's advantage in symbolic APIs when training on many GPUs. In some specific cases, Gluon is 3x faster than PyTorch, but take this with a grain of salt as benchmarks depend on so many factors. And its integration with AWS is unbeatable because Duh, it's Amazon's own pipeline. Let's not forget Microsoft though. CNTK or Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit is a DL framework that supports Python, C++, C Sharp, and Java. It's got support for CNNs and RNNs and it's used in Skype, Xbox, and Cortana. It's targeted toward letting developers easily build models for products in speech and image problems. And it offers support for Apache Spark. It's the easiest of all the frameworks to integrate into Azure, Microsoft's cloud offering. And one thing in particular I like about CNTK is that it handles passing sequences of varied length better than the other frameworks. In TF, you have to do padding, masking, and sometimes even write your own softmax function that ignores masked elements. In PyTorch, the scenario is less painful with functions like pack padded sequences, but you still have to pad at the beginning. Masking in general makes your model vulnerable to errors. In CNTK, you just have to pass the sequence without any padding or requiring a mask later on and everything is taken care of. It handles sequences of variable length internally. Some of the criticisms of CNTK include its strict license as they have not adopted conventional open source licenses like GPL, ASF, or MIT. 
The community seems to consist of mostly Windows developers who would like to include machine learning models in either desktop or mobile applications. Also, shout out to Chainer, a framework created by a Japanese startup. It's similar to PyTorch in that it has a native imperative API, but it's difficult to debug. The community is relatively small, but it's supported by giants like IBM, Intel, and in my fantasies, Mechagodzilla. It can be run on multiple GPUs with little effort, and the main use case we've seen of it thus far is in speech recognition, machine translation, and sentiment analysis. If your core programming language is Java, definitely take a look at Deep Learning 4J. It's written mainly for Java and Scala and supports a huge variety of neural networks. It was made for enterprise scale and works with Apache Hadoop and Spark on distributed CPUs and GPUs. Also, their documentation is stellar. Java isn't very popular among machine learning projects, so it's hard to integrate it with other ML libraries. Perhaps the main utility here is that Android apps are usually written in Java, thus this would be a good choice if you'd like to build a full stack Java pipeline, which includes Android devices and Speaking of mobile, shout out to Core ML. It's not a framework that's made to build models necessarily, but it does help you bring existing models built in other frameworks to Apple devices. And last but not least, let's talk about Onyx, a Pokemon with a pretty high HP, but also the Open Neural Network Exchange format. It was developed in partnership between Microsoft and Facebook. They both decided there was a need for interoperability in the AI tools community, since developers often find themselves locked into one framework or ecosystem. Onyx enables more of these tools to work together by allowing them to share models. The idea is that you can train a model with one tool stack and deploy it using another for inference and prediction. To ensure this kind of interoperability, we must export our model into the Onyx format, which is a serialized representation of the model in a protobuf file. Overall, choosing the perfect framework for a DL project can be hard. You have to take into account many factors, like the type of architecture you'll be developing with, which programming language you're going to use, the number of tools you need, etc. Here are my conclusions. If you're a beginner to programming in general, use Keras, as it's still the easiest library to learn from. If you'd like to build a production-grade application and deploy it to Google Cloud, use TensorFlow. If you'd like to do research, use PyTorch, but also check out Sonnet. If you prefer deploying to AWS, use MXNet. If you want to deploy to Azure, use CNTK. If you're a Java developer, Deep Learning 4J is your best bet. I don't think Chainer's got anything unique compared to the other frameworks. And once you've already started building a model, use Onyx to use tools from other framework ecosystems with it. Oh, and anything iOS related, you can leverage Core ML for. What's your favorite framework? Let me know in the comments section and please subscribe for more programming videos. For now, I've got to define and run. So, thanks for watching.